Welcome to CFD for Industry. I'm Cade Beck, and I'm your host. In this podcast, we'll pull back the curtain on what it takes to do successful CFD for Industry. We'll talk with industry experts at the leading edge of technology who have diverse business, consulting, and research and development experience. So join me as we learn together about what it takes to do CFD for Industry. Julio Mendez is the lead CFD engineer for Cordessa where he's developing a CFD corrosion tool set in partnership with Siemens for the United States Air Force. He also has a private CFD consulting business. In today's episode, you'll learn what Julio did to get a bedrock foundation for CFD. Thank you so much, Julio, for joining the show today. I am just thrilled to talk with you today. Really quickly, if you just want to briefly introduce yourself and what you're working on right now in CFD. Sure, sure. Uh, well, um, I've been working in CFD for more than 15 years. I started working in CFD in 2007. Actually, I ended up in CFD just by coincidence. And I think I explained or shared that experience in a previous interview with uh, John Schoner on his really nice blog, How This Is, uh, how, this is how I Mesh, I think that's the name. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, I didn't know how to write the hello world. I didn't know anything about computers. Uh, but when I talked to a professor to get my thesis, because back home, you have to do a senior project and a thesis. Um, and I did knock the door. I said, hey, I need a topic to graduate. I said, well, I have something called CFD. I said, well, let's, let's see that. And when he showed me the picture, wow, that was impressed. I was impressed. And I said, I want to, uh, to do this. And he said, OK, cool, awesome. But um. I later understood and knew the reason why he didn't have a student and because he's, he's an old style professor. So basically I had to read every single page from Patanka's book, even before starting like discussing the topic. But that gave me a lot of uh, time. It gave me the opportunity to really understand the inside out of CFD. So then I started working on my thesis in undergrad in turbulence. I graduated, it was a great topic. Then after that, I right after that, I started my master degree, which uh, my master degree where I worked in multi-phase flows. Actually, I worked in multi-phase flows. And then after that, I did my PhD uh, four years later. I started my PhD here in the U.S. in North Carolina and T State University, where I worked in turbulence modeling with large A simulations. And then I switched to hypersonic supersonic flows, where I worked with a uh, professor Ferguson in the scheme called IDS, or Integral Differential Scheme. Then I graduated in 2018. I joined Cordesa, where I'm in charge of developing uh, workflow solutions for uh, electrochemical applications, more specifically galvanic corrosion and um, ECM or electrochemical machining. So here I'm in charge of developing new techniques, new workflow, uh, connecting multiple packages to do interesting things, uh, because most of the time you have to grab pieces from multiple things or multiple packages to be able to resolve nowadays the problems which are really really complex that's basically what i've done in the last 15 years in cfd a lot of coding a lot of, of high performance computing absolutely uh, i still do research uh, with academia with professors with other students and i've used a lot of commercial packages as well so i would say i've been at both ends of the spectrum yeah yeah really it's readily apparent as you describe the types of problems you've worked on the depth and breadth that you have like i'm I'd love to hear even just a little bit about the the multi-phase stuff you did. It, some turbo machinery, right? And your professional experience. And... Yes, yes, I did that as well. Yes, well, I, I worked in, back in Venezuela. Uh, I worked at Siemens, where I was a specialist gas turbine. I think that was a position. Um, gas turbine, yes, especially gas turbine engineer, something like that. Uh, at Siemens, uh, I did a lot of CFD component for gas turbines. Uh, but that was... Um, a really short experience because I just spent one year at Siemens before coming to the U.S. But okay. it was really, really nice. It was actually really, really nice. Uh, um, as, as far as multi-phase flow is concerned, I worked uh, with Eulerian Lagrangian mole in my matrix. Okay. Uh, I uh, studied uh, vertical separators. Uh, that's a really, really uh, nice topic. And um, then I helped another student from Keys in Turkey, uh, Turkey um, 
to work with horizontal separator as well. So basically, okay. that was my experience with multi-phase flows. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. With my master in my master degree, I've worked on other other applications within in about multi-phase flows. Yeah, well. I think um, real quick, if I can go back to the way that you and I met each other, I had posted on LinkedIn about some things that I had learned and just wanting to share those things with other people who were starting CFD. And we'd ended up connecting and talking a little bit more. And you had shared that experience of going through every page of Peth and Carr's book. And Very I was cool. just blown away by that. And I think that kind of leads to the heart of what we'll get at in today's discussion of with CFD codes that are so easy to access and so easy to jump in and start seeing contour plots, seeing results, seeing monitors, whatever you want to look at. You seem to have had one of the most intense introductions before you ever touched a solver. Really though, like yeah, like yeah, people yeah. don't get that now yeah. from our experience. Yeah. And this has kind of fed a lot of our discussions that we've had over the time of a lot yeah. of people I feel like want to do good CFD, but we're just outpacing the amount of mentors that can really help them do good CFD. Yeah. yeah. So if you can just speak to what that was like going through it and how that shaped your career, really, it seems like it's had a huge trajectory. And you even bring this up in that How I Mesh blog. Um, but yeah, I'm just interested if you have any more insight on that and, yeah. and what advice you yeah. would give to people starting out today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. That was, initially I was really frustrated because I didn't know how to write the hello world. It was, I was really frustrated. Okay. But when I, when I started reading the book, imagine I was 24 years, something like that. That's basically, you're pretty much ready to graduate. Your friends are graduating faster because they chose uh, easier <laughs> topics and they were they started making money. I was still I was working on something that it was really difficult for me to grasp. Uh, but later I was oh this is a nice oh this is interesting. Huh, let me just keep understanding and learning and learning. And I think that was the best thing and the best experience I have ever had. And I have to be really thankful with my mentors and professor back home that I need to. Thank uh, Professor Gilberto Materano, Professor Jose Rincón, Professor Juan Damier. Those are the, prof oh, by the way, they, they got their PhD in England when CFD was actually blooming. They got their PhD at Cranfield, and the other one got his PhD in another university in, in England when CFD was actually blooming. So that's why we, I was trained with that hardcore mind of CFD. Yeah. Uh, I remember my master's degree actually was in CFD. It is called uh, computational thermal sciences. But when you see the, the courses, the coursework, you don't see anything about commercial software. My courses were numerical methods, advection, convection, convection diffusion, uh, finite element uh, method for computational fluid dynamics, uh, advanced thermodynamics. So it, when you start seeing that, you realize, oh, this is hardcore numerical methods. And there were like two numerical methods. And um, that was a master. But when I started with the master, I already understood a lot of things because I had gone through the process of Patanka. And that was really good. I strongly recommend anyone who wants to really get into the CFD uh, ball game or game to do that. I recommend Patanka. That's every time somebody asks me, I always recommend Patanka because he's the best appetizer you can ever have. The yeah. best appetizer. And then then I remember I used Malala Sequeira's book and then I used Perik's book. But Patankar's was my very first book. And it helped me a lot. It helped me a lot. Of course, it was really complicated. I, I won't say it was not. It was really complex. But I had my, my mentor with me, my advisor. Who, we used to meet every single Friday, Kate, yeah. from 2, I think it was like 2 p.m. all the way to 6 p.m. or something like that. Every Friday. So I was uh, almost a kid, a teenager, and my friends were having fun. And I was in school from every Friday from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And I was I was exhausted. But then uh, when I started, like, enjoying the experience was the best thing, the best yeah. thing ever. And um, I, I recommend that. I recommend that 100 percent. If you can stay away from commercial software when you're just a start, you're, you're just starting your journey. That's the best thing. And if you can use a language. That is not, for example, Python, because Python is really forgiven, really simple. But if you can start using something like really complex, like Java, C++, or Fortran, that would be even better because you're going to develop good practices when you develop solvers. For example, I started with Fortran 77. Fortran 77, that was, and then I jumped 
to Fortran 7, in Fortran 90, C++, Java, and well, now I've used a bunch of different uh, languages. And, and now I feel that all that experience really paid off. It really paid off. Yeah, I think that's just a mindset shift of the way things are marketed to get results now, get up to speed now. And what you've described has been my experience as well. The harvest takes time and yes. you can't force that growth. You can't rush nope. it. You can't skip nope. steps. Nope. And when nope. you try There's to, no mm -hmm. you end up paying for it later because yes. you've missed stuff. Because my experience was almost as opposite as it can get from yours. My professor had never, he, he was a um a physical physical modeler so i i got a job in a lab as an undergrad and mm -hmm. it was go learn cfd we had a an academic license to star ccm mm -hmm. plus and so mm -hmm. i'd had mm -hmm. fluid mechanics i'd had numerical methods but there really wasn't any primer and so i i, I was able to to learn things and and make progress but it, I've gone back and started from square one um, in the PhD and really just built it from the ground up. And I'm still building by nowhere. Yeah, <laughs> Am me I too. Where me, I too. Be? me too. But, me too. Me too. Yeah, I'm glad you just acknowledge. I think so many people, their first thought is, what's wrong with me? Why is this so hard? And it's like, that's normal. Vector calculus doesn't come easy for anyone. And then you throw yeah. in the programming side of things. And it's just no. part of the process. It's part of the learning yes. process. If it's hard, yes. you're on the right track. <laughs> Yes, yes, you're right. You're right. You're so, right. The, 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 there's no, there's no shortcuts here. And the sh and the sooner you start, the better. I, I was so fortunate that I started in my undergrad. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just an undergrad student. Then I went to my master. Then the PhD. The problem that usually yeah. happens, and I saw that with my friends in the PhD, they basically jumped straight from the from the undergrad to the PhD. The PhD. And in the undergrad, uh, undergrad, they just did their uh, senior project and all of that. But they just made a huge jump, and there was a huge. Uh, they they had to do so much to just to catch up with when you want to do hardcore CFD or fundamental research on CFD. So you, the sooner you start, the better. So if you like CFD, fortunately there are many people that really enjoy and like CFD, and they're on the ground, something like that. Just start right there, doing the right thing. Just start with the books. Make sure you understand the physics. There are many many good books. Uh, and of course, every book has its own uh, uh, strength. And I think we have shared that in the past. For example, I have a bunch of different books because each book has its own stuff that, oh, I like this book because of this. I like that book because of that. So once you start developing that experience and that knowledge, it will definitely be a lot easier to tackle and resolve real problems. Because at the end of the day, we want to resolve real problems, either scientific problems or Problems related to um, uh, academic, no, uh, professional, like a professional engineer. That's basically what we have to do. Yeah, I think this is a good segue. I think there's there's two separate approaches. Often, I feel like in my experience, there's and this is a generalization, but academia is often asking, "How close can we get? Can can we get a better representation? Can we get yes. more refined?" Yes. Whereas industry. Yes is going to ask, are we accurate enough? There, there's a yes. lot of other moving parts. There's the economics, there's the manufacturing, yep. there's the construction tolerances. Are we close enough? Yep. And so could yep. you speak to what your experience has been? Yes, um, of course. Of course. Let, let me start with, 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 with um, as a professional engineer, because we both are professional engineers. Well, I don't have, I don't, I don't have a PE, but we both work in the professional world. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's important to mention, okay? You have to draw a line. It's like wearing multiple hats. And currently at this point, uh, I'm happy I'm wearing multiple hats again. I'm working with a paper with Professor Tapan Kumar Gupta that I, I expect to finish and present in at AIAA AI, AI, AI AA Aviation in June. I'm really happy uh, I'm working with him finally. This is like a dream come true. Uh, somebody who I'm really, really thankful uh, to because he helped me a lot. So when, when you were the head of academia, you have to like, you have to answer the question, okay, how, 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 how else can I do to improve the result? How close I can get to the analytical solution? How, you are right. And you, there's freedom. You, you, you have so much room to, to actually grow. You, you don't have, nothing, nothing prevents you or nothing really, uh, pro, you have so much things to do because that's how academia works. Whereas as a uh, professional engineer, no, you don't have the luxury. For, him, for example, today I talked to a client and I told him, look, yes, CFD is definitely something we can use to resolve this problem. We can definitely resolve this problem with CFD, but we have a limited budget. So based on the limited budget, we have to come up with certain constraints because otherwise you're going to basically spend time and time and time. And you are right. 
Um, I, I'm with the other person I work at Cordesa. Um, he recently, well, not recently, last year, he finished his PhD last year. Um, so he, I'm working with him and I, I, I have to remind him, uh, his name is Bashir, by the way, Bashir. Bashir, you have to, you have to understand that no model is perfect. All results are wrong. It all depends how you make sense out of the physics you are getting. And of course, making sure you're using the right physics, the right model, your mesh, and all the different rest ingredients that we have to keep um, keep a, a look at. Um, but he's always trying for more, more, more. And I said, no, but this is not where we, at, in industry, we have to draw a line. And for example, we're currently working on a technology uh, that I developed a model that's basically, oh, by the way, multi-phase flows. That's with a uh, volume of fluid, the VOF method with capillary, with uh, porous media. I created a model. Uh, it's basically a source term that I brought to Storcycian Plus, by the way, okay. to mimic the capillary forces inside a porous media. Okay. Uh, the problem is nobody else has done that in the past. There's no information on paper. So basically, I started just connecting dots from multiple source resources, and I, I came up with a source term that it basically brought to start system plus. We calibrated the model under certain conditions, and now we are trying testing the model under multiple different conditions. And he wants always to get the best. I told him, no, this is not possible because remember when I created this model three years ago, we calibrated the model with the information we had three years ago under very specific conditions. And under that specific condition, the model worked pretty well. We cannot expect to now change multiple things on the model and expect the model will provide you the same um, uh, confidence. But you have to keep that in mind. So for example, I remember we were running up multiple uh, cases and the case, the solution uh, suggests that, well, the result was not what we were expecting. And I told him, look, we have to pretty print the tool. We cannot just keep running and running. You have to keep in mind that that model was developed for one specific application. Now, now we are trying to do something similar into this application. So that's one of one example. The other one, for example, I remember another project with the DOE. Um, I was working on an application for a nuclear fuel, what is the name? Uh, CASC, yes. Um, so it is a really complex, a really complex application, multi-physics, radiation, uh, really, really complicated. And you can just go and go and go and add in extra layers of complexity. But at some point you have to decide, okay, this is my line. I cannot go further because it will take more time, more resources, more money. And of course, you have to know what information you're going to use to calibrate your model to assess if your decision or your solution is right or close enough, close enough. Because at the end of the day, it won't ever be 100% the same as your analytical solution. Well, it is difficult to have analytical solution for applications uh, common in uh, industry. Um, but you have to be, uh, you have to make sure you have the data and you can use that data efficiently with your application. In academia, well, no, academy is different. It's a different mindset. And that's the problem where many people fail when they transition from academia to industry or the industry from academia. You have to make sure that you are in the right place. You have to just remember, okay, this is academia, this is the mindset. This is industry, this is the mindset. It's, it's two, two different mindsets, Kate. Yeah, really are. They, I've described it as one of them is like football or soccer, and one of them is like basketball. You're penalized for using your hands in one. You're not penalized for using your hands in another. The Perfect. points are orders of magnitude greater at, in the yes. final game. Like it's it's different. I like it's, both. I, I enjoy both, but they're different. And you got to make sure you yeah. play by the rules that you're playing with. Yes, great example. Great example. But Kate, something I, I by the way, I read the, your post today about the different skills. Something that you can, you leverage in industry are the soft skills you develop in academy, like writing, like yep. communication skill, yep. presentation skill. Um, and sometimes people uh, underestimate those skills. But and I've seen people without PhD, without master, that they have amazing writing skills, amazing uh, communication skills, incredible um, presentation skills. But usually those skills you develop here you can transition and you yeah. can use or leverage them here. Similarly here, when, once you start moving things from industry to academia, it's, it's definitely appropriate as well. So you have to wear multiple hats. You have mm -hmm. to be really smart how you leverage these skills. Yeah, yeah, and it's a it's a continual effort. It really is to, it is. to be able it is. to do that. So yeah. that's great. That's great, great counsel, great wisdom there. Um, maybe if we can also dig into your PhD a little more, Integro Differential Scheme. 
Um, what was it? I know you converted a lot of the code. That was a huge portion of it. Um, mm -hmm. What what was that experience like? What did you learn? What were the obstacles? I guess this is also pivoting more towards academia stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful experience, Kate. Uh, I love academia. I actually had the conversation yesterday with one of my friends, and he asked me because, well, why are you always reading something? Why are you always because, like, like I mentioned, I'm writing a paper with Professor Tappan. It's because I love that kid. I cannot yeah. imagine my life without science, without research. Um, of course, now my position is industry. I have to do many things that are different from, from actual like research and development, even though my position has a lot of research and development, but more industry oriented. Mm -hmm. um, but academia for me is the place I belong. So uh, when I started my PhD, um, I started working with one professor with in turbulence. That's basically, I joined his group because he needed somebody with experience in turbulence. And now please remember what I just mentioned about my undergrad that was in turbulence. So the, my thesis in undergrad in Fortran 77 in turbulence was the key which opened the door for my PhD, not even my master degrees. He didn't even care about my master. He did care about my undergrad because what's in turbulence for Trans 77. Yeah. So he he had a code. He was working with a team of, of professors with a code in Fortran's 90 in turbulence. So they needed somebody with turbulence, with experience in turbulence. And uh, that person had to have also experience and knowledge about large AD simulation. So I I just knew the very fundamental stuff from large AD simulation. So I joined the group. Um, uh, I worked uh, with that professor for two years. That's where I learned about high performance computing because he said, there's no way we can make breakthroughs with computers like the one we already have. We have to use HPC. So um, the, I spent the first two semesters from my PhD taking classes from uh, computer science and a bunch of classes from the mechanical department, of course, because core courses and all of that. So that's where I take I took classes from high performance computing, like MPIs, fundamental, then advanced, um, uh, other topics related to um, um, computer science, like visualization, many, 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 many different things. That was amazing. So unfortunately, that grant, um, there was an issue with the grant. So they stopped, uh, the, the, the agency that was funding the research stopped uh, funding the, the research. And unfortunately, that professor was laid off, not because of that, because of their problems. So I was basically hanging in the air. So I had two years, and I worked in large age simulation for two years. Actually, we were developing a model called temporal large age simulations. It is not new. Um, somebody else worked on temporal large age simulation, but we wanted to use a kind of different uh, filtering scheme for the, for the time integration. I also have to thank Professor Filippo Maria Denaro, who helped me and still helps me a lot when it comes to large age simulation. He's a reference in the world of large age simulation. Um, and I'm really thankful I had the opportunity to talk and he helped me a lot. All that work basically went to waste. Uh, and then I was just looking for another uh, group. So then this professor, Professor Ferguson, my final PhD advisor, talked to me and he told me, hey, Julio, I need somebody with experience in HPC and Fortran 90. I said, okay, I'm the guy. <laughs> and uh, I joined his group and it was an amazing experience, Kate. Uh, it was amazing because I then I transitioned to supersonic hypersonic flows, which is an amazing topic. He was a student from Professor Anderson. Imagine John Anderson is a student. He's a full professor, so he has decades of experience in numerical computation. He has worked in hypersonic flows, scramjets, wave riders, uh, oof, many many topics. So he he's a really a reference in hypersonic flows here in the U.S. Um, and it was really amazing to work with such a knowledgeable professor. Um, the idea is basically groups idea or merge ideas from finite difference method and finite volume method. And that's why we call it integral differential scheme because it has component from finite difference. It has component from finite volume and it still has the, like, the good things from this and this one. And um, I was in charge of, of course, finalizing a few things from the code, um, from the solver, excuse me, the algorithm. I basically created the version for high performance computing um, I remember that we ran that with even 2,000 cores at the moment. That was 2017. That was a huge milestone because, well, our research group was really, really small. So that was a huge milestone. I also created another version for GPUs. So we made a lot of progress in that in, in that direction. Um, 
he was really happy and I was happy to see my advisor happy, of course. Um, and uh, that gave me the exposure to the other side of the spectrum of high velocity flow or high energy flows because I was always working with multi-phase flows and turbulence. So jumping to hypersonic flows where things are really, really fast, where you have to now take into consideration multiple things as far as solver is concerned, because with turbulence, well, you usually have certain kind of solver for large chain simulation and compressible flows. And for supersonic and compressible flows, now you have other kind of solver. And that's why I, I feel so comfortable when I think about, oh, incompressible flow solvers. Oh, compressible flow solver. It's just, it's easy for me. Whereas there are people who spend their entire life just working on one type of solver, which is great because they really become experts in that area or other ones that become expert on incompressibles. So um, it, it was a beautiful experience. I was so, so fortunate. That I presented my work at very interesting places at great conferences that gave me opportunity to meet great, great people. It was amazing, Kate. It was amazing. I really, really miss those days. Yeah. I really miss those days. Yes. I'm so glad to hear. Oftentimes, I'll I'll talk with others about their PhD experience, and sadly, not everyone has a quality PhD experience that they that they miss. And mm. I, I feel the same. My PhD was a wonderful time to really dig in and focus. I was doing magneto hydrodynamics, and I, I miss well, those days. I really do. It was yeah. yeah I, I feel yeah. very similar. That's that's awesome. I want to share with you something, uh, Kate, um, because uh, I, I I I like to repeat that. People usually think, oh, well, let me use my name as example. Oh, Julio, he's a very lucky guy. He's a lucky guy. He's a lucky guy. Okay. Well, to be lucky, you need three things. You have to love what you do. You have to really love what you do. What you, do. you have to work really, really, really hard. And you have to have a talent. When you have these three guys, then you have that extra component that comes from, I don't know, from the universe, which is the luck. You are lucky because you have these three components. So what I want to say with this, or what I mean with this is, when I was in the PhD, I remember I used to show up, I was the first one to get into the lab. I was the last one leaving the lab. I, I was always learning. I was always studying. I was always reaching out to other professors. I was always, I was always on that, on that interest. I was always interested in keep learning and learning and learning. And I remember once, I, basically I just defended, I had defended my thesis, my PhD thesis, my other friends defended their thesis. So I was with my PhD advisor and he told me, Julio, you have a gift that not anyone in this group has. And that is because you love what you do. Mm. You he told me the, the bug of academia beat you. Something like that. Yes, yeah, something about the, the bug that beat me about the academia and all of that. And I think that that was right. I remember that I, I was when we were discussing about the algorithm, where we were discussing about new ideas. When I, I was always like really into that, and and every time I had a resource or a reference, oh, I just read this paper from nineteen, I don't nineteen something. Oh, where did you get this paper from? Oh, a reference from another reference from another reference. Because the three components were with me, and uh, and, and I think then I feel lucky, yes, because I have had these very nice experiences. Because it is like that. You are always working. You are always trying. You have the talents. You you love. You you are passionate with the things you do. And I think that's that. That's the thing that everybody needs in in their professional careers. Yeah, yeah. There's some interesting research. I don't know how much you've been exposed to the work of Cal Newport. Um, he does. He's a computer science professor. Anyway, one of the things that that he's documented in some of his research is the sequence in which those come. You work really hard at something, you develop a talent, and then you love it. And so yeah. it's been really interesting. They're all still three there. They're all there. Um, oh yes. But just the oh, yes. sequence in which they come, right? It takes time. You have to increase your capacity your understanding and there's no shortcuts like we've said there's really no nope. shortcuts to this no, so no no, no that's no, really no. really good advice there one other thing that i think is interesting i think i saw this just recently from you you said you've recently been bitten by the lattice boltzmann bug so we oh, talked yeah. a lot about <laughs> classical uh classical algorithms and methods finite difference finite element finite volume what, what are your thoughts what's been your experience with lattice boltzmann so far i've also recently started to look at it but i'm relatively new uh to lattice okay. boltzmann so okay okay that, that's amazing that's great um we all know the the limitations that the navier stock equation has okay we we are really aware of that so um uh i i started like wondering okay we we need for example for multi-phase flows actually i started looking for some alternative for multi-phase flows um and then a, a company uh, suggested me, hey, why don't you try our, our product? 
uh, is based on Lattice Boltzmann. And all. I, I knew what Lattice Boltzmann was. I said, okay, let, let me just give a try. Actually, I remember I had this conversation with somebody with Siemens some like few years ago, and I asked him, why don't you guys try Lattice Boltzmann? Um, we were just talking, I'm like, I mean, nothing, nothing serious. And um, because I told him, I remember, hey, Lattice Boltzmann is really, really good because of the way he's, I mean, the, the algorithm is, uh, is just, is very local. And that type of locality is what you can exploit on GPUs. That mm-hmm. I remember I told, that, I mentioned that to that guy from, from Siemens, maybe like two or three years ago. Um, but it was just like a random thought. Uh, of course, they haven't done that. And there is a company doing that. Um, and when I tried the solver, I said, wow, I like this. Uh, and of course, that forced me to go back to my books and check about Lattice Boltzmann to refresh some of the concepts and all of that. But I strongly believe it has definitely, it, it will be very, very important in the in the near future in CFD. Um, of course, the limitation with Lattice Boltzmann is that it's only possible or only useful, well, not, there are so, certain schemes that have resolved that issue of the low Mac number and all of that, um, because it has like a, a limitation due to the CFL number, very similar to the explicit, explicit schemes with Navier stock equation. But as far as low Mac number, incompressible flow is concerned, it really shines. It really yeah. shines because the way the algorithm is so simple, um, you don't have to resolve, for example, Poisson equations for pressure, which are really intensive from a computational standpoint. It's really, really local. You don't have to, you don't need things from multiple cells to do your reconstruction of gradients and all of that. And that is why GPUs really shine. That That's why Lattice Woman on GPU really shines. And now we have GPUs that, for example, I was checking the the, 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 uh, the specification from the latest GPUs from NVIDIA, and they're incredible, incredibly good fast. So you can basically, with one GPU, uh, do the same work from hundreds of different CPUs. So I think that's where, uh, for multi-phase application, Lattice Waldman will definitely uh, shine. Yeah, uh, that's that's my opinion. That's my opinion. Yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting looking at that. I had run a, a test case. I think we we're testing the same software, and yep. I What's filled your opinion? up. What? I almost filled up my terabyte drive, <laughs> my solid state <laughs> drive, with just one test case because I was down to a ten thousandth of a second and just okay. resolving some really tight time scales with some phenomena. And I was like, oh man, I got to worry about this when you when you go that small, you're taking a ton of data, and yeah. so I had yeah, to clear yeah, yeah. some things out. So. It was that, just a different not, mindset for me. Usually, I, I, maybe I'm a couple yeah. gigs, five gigs or something, no, but I put like 750 no, you're right. gigs. You're right. You're right. Actually, that was another question from uh, that that blog from John Choner that I, I really appreciate his invitation to write my 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 my, my biography in that in that, yeah. in that uh, magazine. Uh, that was one of the questions, and I think that's one of the issues with CFD or anything that has to do with numerical computation data. For example, this paper with Professor Tapan. Uh, we are going to write another proposal for the insight, and that we are talking about petabytes of data. How we're go- how petabytes of data? So that is amazing. That's huge. How we are going to manage all that data? And it becomes complicated. For example, you you just basically mentioned the the the, the problem you basically uh, faced when you start like writing uh, transient data to your hard drive. But imagine when you are actually working with huge problem like combustion and things like that, where you create bunch of data it's it's complicated data is is difficult is yeah. difficult to manage yep yep yeah yep. yeah it's a uh... Definitely still plenty left to do in, oh, and I yes. think you touched on this as well. CFD is by no means a mature science. We, there are still plenty of new horizons. There's always oh, yes. additional developments, improving yes. the models, refining more physics. Yes. So yes. maybe yes. we can kind of yes. start to wrap up with that. Um, okay. For the next foreseeable future, just where do you see things going? What we touched on what advice you would give to someone jumping in today, right? Start with the basics and drill down and really get your fundamentals. Stay away from commercial software would be your advice. Fortran, yeah. those codes. So as they start layering, what what things do you think are going to be important, right? Some HPC knowledge. Oh, yes. Yes. yes so. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. HPC, absolutely. Gone are the days where you can resolve from with your laptop. No. If you are going after that fidelity, that scale resolving capability, you have to use high performance computing. If you can develop the the, the skills to uh, to build your own uh, HPC application CFD solver, that's great, like MPI and all of that. I had that experience. That's beautiful. Uh, but at least you have to have you have to feel comfortable with high performance computing. There are people who don't know anything about terminal, and when you mention something about Linux, it's like you are basically calling the devil or something like that. 
So you have to feel comfortable with that type of environment. I see, I, I'm so happy, Kate. I'm so happy that I'm seeing so many new companies coming to the game. I'm seeing, for example, I love Cadence um, uh, because I, I, I'm a strong believer of the things they're doing. I personally love that. For example, they recently acquired uh, a company from Cascade uh, that is a uh, GPUs based scale resolving, which is large scale simulation. There is another one that I also uh, like a lot, a Luminary Cloud. Yes, Luminary Cloud. They are also working developing new algorithms from the scratch, from the ground up. And I love that because we are still using the same algorithm from 30 or 40 years ago. And that has been one of my main um, uh, like uh, opinion in the last years. We have to re, you, we have to be really, we, we have to push the, the envelope. We have to try and try and try. And I really like this new kids in the block that they're doing that. And I'm, yeah. I'm really happy to see that. And the same other, the other program we are just mentioning about uh, Lattice Volkman, I love that. I love to see new things because that makes the, the market, of course, more competitive, but it gives you more tool. I don't think, Kate, that you have to become more, I have to be the expert on Star System Plus or the expert in ANSYS Fluent or CFX. No, I believe that CFD is like a toolbox. When you're going to repair something at home, you need a hammer, you need a screwdriver, you need a bunch of different things. And that's how I see the CFD. I've used SimScale because there are problems that I feel SimScale really shines. Oh, let me just use SimScale because it's just perfect for that. Oh, Lattice Volman, now the other program, M-Star, let me just mention the name. Yeah. M-Star, oh, let me use, use that. Um, combustion, well, yes, Star System Plus really is really, really good for combustion. Or large size, you need to have that. But there are people who think, oh, no, I just have to use one package. No. It, it, of course, there are packages that they have multiple good things. But uh, unless you, for example, you have unlimited resources and you have time, unlimited time, unlimited money, unlimited budget, then you can always use just one, one tool. Um, but what I've seen is that usually you have to become familiar and comfortable with multiple tools. And that's one of the things I like about Cadence, for example. They have PointWise, which is one of the best mesh engines in the market. I like that. They also have a very, very good and very, very robust uh, CFD solver, which was before New Mecha. Everybody knows what New Mecha is because it was developed by Professor Hirsch. Yeah. Everyone working in CFD knows what, C what Professor Hirsch books are. Um, and and, and I, I like that because that's like the closest the closest thing I have from like a pure CFD stuff. Star System Plus as well is really really good. But you have to become familiar with that. And um, I, I love I, I like the fact of Cadence, for example, that is totally in the cloud. You don't need to purchase licenses with somebody a, a middleman. You just use your credit card and you create your portal in two or five minutes. Boom, you have your solution up and running. And I feel that that type of solution is the future. Gone are the days where you have to call a, 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 somebody, oh, I need a license. Okay, 60K, this is the wire transfer. Now they will send you the license file. And okay, the license file is just for this machine or you need a network a license. Oh, where, now I need to use this in the cloud. Oh, Jesus Christ, how do I do that? Gone are the days. We have to think about things that are easy to be deployed, easy to maintain, easy to collaborate. And I think that Cadence did a, great, a really, really good job. Siemens is also working on that as well. Um, but, but, but as far as scaling is concerned, they, okay, they have been working on that um, in a very nice, in a very yeah. robust manner. Yeah, that, that's that's my opinion. That's my opinion. Yeah. No, thanks Thanks for sharing. Um, it really is, and this has been evident throughout our conversation that different problems require different tools. And yes. as long as yes. you understand the fundamentals, if someone knows how to fix things, they'll know which tools are best for them and their situation right. and whatever context. Right. So instead of fixating on one tool and mastering one tool, master right. the problems and how those you problems right. can be solved. And exactly, right. I love the analogy of the toolbox and fixing things because you are right. You're it, right. It really is. You, you can. I, I'd rather trust someone who knows problems to fix my problem than trust someone who knows a tool to fix my problem. Yes. Right. Yes. You're, everything's a nail. <laughs> so uh, I remember when I, when I started my, my, my life as a professional CFD engineer back home, uh, I, my boss, he used to like to stop by, okay, Julio, how's everything going with the other person as well, but other people I had in the, we, we were in the office. And I remember once I was analyzing some results, like residuals, I was checking the residual gradients and some transient plots and all of that. And he just, just by looking at that, he said, I think you're going to leave late today, Julio. And I say, how can somebody develop that experience? Because you become, uh, you, 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 
you become somebody who understands the problem. You become somebody who understands the physics. You, understand, you become somebody who really feels what is going on and not just somebody who is pushing bottoms everywhere. And, and that, that reminds me as well, a question I asked my professor when I was doing my master, I, was, I remember that was the class of uh, the course where the course was diffusion. I remember I asked a question, professor, what happens, because basically we know convection and all of that, um, if, if convection basically, um, uh, I forgot the name, convection usually convects energy, okay? Mm -hmm. So what happens when the, basically the velocity at the wall becomes zero? How, how, how come basically you can uh, convect energy at that point? Well, basically it becomes pure diffusion. So just by simple analogies, by just looking at, at facts, just by looking at things that are really like evident, you become such a, a, a strong person when it becomes, when, when you have to resolve problems. That's why it is really important to understand the physics, understand the numerics, understand all the important things, instead of just becoming an expert of one specific tool. That's something very, very important, okay, that I would definitely recommend anyone to, to, to work really hard on that. And just to wrap up and just to finalize, to, to, to conclude, um, I still remember my advisor, my last advisor, Professor Ferguson, when we, I remember we had meetings every Thursday, every Thursday. So uh, we used to go to his office, well, to the conference room, and we were like three guys working in his uh, research group. And when we were showing the results, he always he used to say, don't show me the evidence. Because when, when you show me something evident, even somebody, without a PhD can really understand that. That means you have to really dig deep into the physics. You have to really try to understand this. You have to do not just get away with all the contour plots or the scalar distribution of velocity, scalar distribution of pressure field, because that's what you always see from every single report, not every, excuse me, but many, many reports. Uh, sometimes I, I have to review report from other people. I have sometimes I have customers or time that hey, I need somebody else to check this analysis or this report. You always see the same thing and you have to start thinking in, an, in a different way. And that will give you so much power. It will give you so much different tools to really understand that. And that's, that's basically what happened when, when you, I think that's because I had that strong background in turbulence where you usually have to do multiple, multiple things instead of just showing the scale distribution of velocity field and stuff like that. But that is really, really important. I, and I repeat, my advisor used to say, don't show me the evidence because anyone, even without PhD, understand that. I want to see what is behind that. And that's when I had to start like thinking in it from trying to see the problem from another perspective. Then I had to try to use things that I, I knew from other experiences, from other field of, of, of application. I, that's what I would definitely recommend somebody in CFD or, or anything related to numerical computation. That's that, I think that's a, a good way to, to, to wrap up. That's my, my, my advice. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. Thank you so much. And that's, it's good advice and a lot for people to think about of really what, what the standard is, right? The, I can't remember who said it, but the point of uh, computation is insight, not numbers. So you're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. want the insight. You're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah, you know. you're right. And all, all solutions are wrong. Uh, <laughs> just a few are meaningful. Who was the person who said that? Uh, Fox, but, I uh, think, right? All, Fox, all solutions yeah, are wrong probably. and some are, are useful. <laughs> useful. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is right. Which is yep. right. And I, I remember that was how my uh, professor Kenneth Florchik, uh, rest in peace, he was... He was my mentor in HPC. He then became part of my uh, PhD committee and he was my mentor in HPC. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything I know about HPC is about him. And I remember my first class with him. Just imagine this case. I landed in this country in 2014. I barely spoke English. And when I basically showed up to his class uh, about high performance computing, I just knew the fundamental of computing. I didn't know anything about how high performance computing. And he started the class with that. All solutions are run just a few are useful. And that was, uh, I thought, wow, this is the best way to start a class in numerical <laughs> computation in high performance computing. So yeah. of course, once you add a high performance computer, then you are going to add another source of error that we can discuss some, somewhere later. Uh, but uh, I think that's important to keep in mind as well. Yeah. All solutions are wrong, uh, very few are useful. Yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. Well, if someone wants to get in touch with you after listening to the podcast, what what's the best way to do that, Julio? Uh, via email, yes, definitely via email. Uh, I I don't know if you can add that on your, yeah, on your video. Yeah, I can add that for sure. It, okay, yeah, you can you can. I will send okay. you my, my my email address so that you can awesome. just add that. Yeah, awesome. No problem. Okay. Well, thank you again, and it was yeah, great to much, talk Kate. with you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you for listening. Really, thank you. What happens next is the most important part of the episode. Pick one thing that you can do in the next day to apply what you learned. Then do that one thing. See you on the next episode.